The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading, every weekend on BBC World News. Rescuers are using their bare hands and you can see them throwing down blocks and trying to search desperately for survivors. And every minute that goes by, every hour that passes, lessens our chances of finding survivors here. We're right in the centre of the city of Iskanderun and what you can see here are two trucks that have just turned up handing out aid supplies. We break stories from more places than any other international news broadcaster. We are the leaders in global breaking news. Live with Lucy Hawkins on BBC World News. Angry words over Ukraine as the US and Russia come face to face at the G20 meeting in Delhi. Sergei Lavrov accuses the West of using blackmail and threats to undermine support for its invasion. Washington says Antony Blinken spoke to his counterpart from Moscow for just 10 minutes. Enough time to reinstate America's support for Ukraine. Russia now says it won't sign the usual G20 declaration. We'll ask if the disagreements mean diplomacy is not working. Also ahead, protests in Greece at the head-on train collision which killed at least 42. There have been resignations and court appearances, but will that be enough to end the anger? And an area of natural beauty under threat in the Philippines as a sunken tanker starts to leak oil. Autism meant he didn't speak until he was 11 years old. Now he's lecturing at Cambridge University. We're going to bring you the amazing story of Jason Ade. In the next half hour, we'll take you live to Delhi, Riga and Greece. Russia says there's been no joint declaration at the G20 foreign ministers meeting in India after angry exchanges between Washington and Moscow over the invasion of Ukraine. The US Secretary of State said the talks have been marred by the unprovoked and unjustified attack. Russian officials, meanwhile, said Moscow and Beijing had agreed to oppose what they called Western blackmail and threats. But this hasn't been confirmed yet by China. Let's take you straight to Delhi. We can join the BBC's Zubair Ahmed, who is there for us. So, Zubair, angry words exchanged. I guess, to some extent, people were expecting this, the tension over Ukraine to dominate the meeting. Absolutely. It was uh, on the expected lines. Tensions over uh, Russia's war in Ukraine have uh, dominated uh, the foreign um, ministers' uh, meeting of uh, G20 uh, group of countries in Delhi. And ev even though uh, Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister of India, has urged foreign uh, ministers to put aside their divisions and differences, but there were angry exchanges between the Russian and the U.S. foreign minister. Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken met um, uh, his counterpart, Russian counterpart, Mr. Lavrov, uh, on the sidelines of the G20 meet just a while ago. It was a brief but uh, surprise encounter that came as the Russian government uh, accused the Western nations of, uh, as you said, black, uh, blackmail and threats. It was the first one-on-one -on -one, uh, meeting, uh, it must be uh, uh, recalled, that um, after the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine over a year ago, uh, this was their first meeting and it didn't go that well. It's unusual to not have a joint declaration at the end of a meeting like this, Sabir. Will India see this as a failure because it's hosting the summit? Well, India has tried uh, its best. Uh, as I said, the Prime Minister Modi has told the ministers who were gathered here, uh, urging them to uh, uh, focus on uh, the positive points, on the uh, points where they converge rather than the points of differences. Um, but uh, we were expecting this uh, because uh, uh, last week there was a finance minister's uh, meet in Bangalore uh, where uh, Again, uh, there were differences and there was there was no joint communique and a summary was uh, issued by uh, the host country, India. And this is exactly what India has done again um, in the foreign, foreign uh, uh, ministers meet. 
Zabir, thank you for the update from Delhi. State news agencies in Russia say a sabotage group working for Ukraine has infiltrated a border region and taken several people hostage. According to the governor of Bryansk region, which borders Ukraine, saboteurs fired on a car, killing one person. He added that shelling had also taken place from Ukraine. This incident happening in the village of Lubachanya. Russia's FSB security service saying it's trying to engage an armed group of Ukrainian nationalists who have crossed the border. Now, we haven't had any comment from Kyiv, uh, but the Bryansk region is understood to be a base for Russian drone attacks. Let's take you live to Riga. We can join the BBC's Sergei Goryeshko, who is there for us. Sergei, very good to see you. Can you just explain the significance potentially of this moment and what's happening? Well, we should admit that... Uh, that there has been none reports during this year of war of any Ukrainian soldiers or armed groups entering Russian regions. I mean, not these occupied territories of Ukraine, but exactly the territory of Russia. There have been uh, many shellings in uh, border regions such as like uh, Kursk, Belgorod or Bryansk region where this uh, today's uh, incident has happened. Still, uh, none of the Ukrainian group has ever entered there. Uh, but in the meantime, we don't know for sure whether they were really Ukrainian soldiers there because uh, now there are reports that, that Russian volunteer corps, this is the uh, special division of Ukrainian territorial defense, uh, which uh, which actually consists of Russian soldiers, that uh, 40, about 40 or 45 people from these uh, Russian volunteer corps entered uh, the village, just actually took the photos and uh, were in a small fight with uh, Russian border patrol and left. Um, and so now they are uh, those who were on uh, the footage, those who were on that uh, photos and videos which were posted on uh, social media. They are like given the interviews to different uh, Russian and Ukrainian media telling that they were behind this attack. They are claiming that they have not killed any anyone. Uh, they only uh, had uh, a fight with border patrol. But as you've mentioned, uh, Russian authorities tell that uh, one person from the village has been killed. There were also reports of uh, children uh, who were driving in a school bus and that they were killed or wounded. But these reports are not confirmed yet by the officials. So, okay, thank you very much for that update from Riga. Protests have erupted in Greece over the rail crash which killed 43 people. Many have seen this as an accident waiting to happen. Rioters clashing with police outside the headquarters of the Hellenic train in Athens. That's the company responsible for maintaining Greece's railways. We also saw protests in uh, Thessaloniki and the city of Larissa, near where the disaster happened on Tuesday night. The government saying an independent investigation will deliver justice. And of course, three days of national mourning have been declared across the country. There's still such a sense of shock from that passenger service which crashed head on into a freight train, uh, causing the front carriages to burst into flames. We have uh, some live pictures from the scene that we can show you right now, actually, because there's an ongoing investigation, of course, and special cranes have been brought in to remove the wreckage. So it's a very active scene there uh, at Larissa as the operation continues there and the investigation continues into what actually happened. But the other footage that we have today that is new to us is uh, some quite dramatic footage. We're about to show it to you. It is CCTV footage of the moment that the two trains collided shortly before midnight on Tuesday night near the town of Tempe when the passenger train carrying 350 people collided. Have a look. A very dramatic moment you can see here as uh, this CCTV footage shows just the incredible impact and that moment when the freight train collided with the passenger plane and you could train and you can see the flames there as well really dramatic well Nick Beek is outside a hospital in Larissa some of the injured are being treated there and he said the local station master has appeared in court on Thursday it does seem that the wheels of justice have moved very quickly, far too quickly for a lot of people we've been speaking to because they don't really buy what the Greek Prime Minister has said, that this was, in his words, a, a, a tragic human error. 
and instead they point to some of the repeated warnings that have been given over the years that this was an accident waiting to happen, that the rail network was simply not safe here, that it was antiquated, that there weren't computerised parts of the line, that a lot of drivers were relying on communication between each other before they moved along different parts of the track, even though this was the, the main line between two key cities in this country. So th there is real anger there and that's been reflected in the protests we've seen in this city and others overnight. Well, let's try and bring you some answers as to what could have happened because railway union representatives say they repeatedly warned that the network isn't safe. Live to Greece now, I'm joined by Dr. Zoe Christoforou, who is an assistant professor in transportation at the University of Patras. Professor, very good to see you. Uh, so many people want to know what happened, of course, and we have uh, seen the station master appear in court today. But from what you've been able to see, what do you believe the cause of the crash was? Uh, hello. At this stage, we don't know, of course, the exact uh, circumstances of the accident. Investigation is needed to, uh, to know the exact causes, but uh, I'm certain of one thing. It's not, of course, just a human error, uh, because uh, the, uh, the uh, Greek railways are currently lacking uh, in many aspects, personnel, the training, the know-how, and, of course, uh, the infrastructure. And this, even though uh, many important investments have, have been made over the last 20 years, uh, we do have uh, modern systems of operations, but they were never actually uh, used. So uh, human errors, technical deficiencies, these are things that may happen. But of course, if... Uh, Professor, why were these modern systems not in use? Uh, this is the, the big question. Uh, we don't know uh, exactly. Uh, they, they were never used. Uh, they were stolen in some cases uh, and they are not operational. And uh, it's been now like 10 years that they, uh, they are not being used. Uh, we have the European Traffic Control System Level 1 uh, in Greece uh, that has been deployed uh, on the trains, but it's not used actually. And this is the fault then, surely, of the Ministry for Transport? Yeah, of course. So when the, the unions, when protesters say today this was just an accident waiting to happen, would you agree with them? Uh, of course, certainly, I agree with them. Uh, human errors may occur and uh, we as engineers, we should uh, design systems that uh, reduce the probability of accidents or uh, reduce their consequences. Uh, so uh, um, the accident would happen uh, anyway, maybe, but it would uh, not have uh, the impact that it had uh, a Tuesday night. Not so many people killed. Professor Zoe Christoforou, thank you very much for joining thank us. You. And let's just return you to the scene now uh, where we know as well three days of national mourning declared and in Greece these pictures just causing not only a huge amount of sorrow and sadness but also real anger as we've just been reflecting on when this passenger service crashed head on into a freight train. And to remind you that many of the 350 passengers who were on board that train were students. They were only in their 20s. They were returning to Thessaloniki after a long weekend celebrating Greek Orthodox Lent. So a real tragedy for Greece and National Morning being observed today. You are live with Lucy Hawking. Still to come, we bring you the amazing story of Jason Arda, who only learned to read and write at the age of 18 and has just been appointed as a professor at Cambridge University. And we'll explain why the US had harsh words for Israel following the latest upsurge in violence in the West Bank. To choose Grana Padano is to embrace its unique Italian values. A moment to be shared. Grana Padano, an Italian feeling. Introducing the new horizon for Riyadh. This is the new Maraba, the world's largest modern downtown. And at its heart, the Mukar, the world's first immersive experiential destination. Step inside and it's unlike anything you've ever seen at a scale that's unprecedented. 
Experience a new horizon. New Maraba. The NFL is this all-consuming thing, you know, and we're all in this echo chamber of football and these large amounts of wages and, you know, and salaries and, you know, and, and just having, being around the best of the best of everything. And then you come back home and it's just, you know, you get to see just the disparity. You're live with Lucy Hawkins. A tanker that sunk in the Philippines on Tuesday has started to leak its cargo of oil and that is threatening to pollute nearby marine reserves. The ship is called the Princess Empress. It went down in rough seas near the island of Mindoro after its engines failed. So search teams are there. They're trying to locate the sunken vessel so they can siphon off the oil. With more on that, here's our Asia Pacific editor, Mickey Bristow. Well, this was on Tuesday it started uh, the ship, uh, the Princess Empress. Um, it lost its engine power, uh, overheated, and then it came into rough seas and it sank. Um, we don't know exactly where it is at the moment. Search planes are out looking for it, trying to spot an area where it might have gone down. Might be as deep as 500 metres or so, so quite deep. On board is about 800 uh, litres uh, of oil. Now, the Philippine Coast Guard initially said that was safe, it wasn't leaking. People had spotted a slick, a pollutants on top of the sea. The Coast Guard said that was just the diesel used to power this vessel. Now it's changed its mind. It says that the oil is starting to leak out. And as you mentioned there, this is an area of, of great natural beauty, one which has been sort of like hidden away somewhat uh, in the Philippines. It's only over recent years that they've realized the marine biodiversity there and the possible tourism that could come from that. So there's a real fear that this could develop into something far larger and, and, and far more damaging. So what kind of operation is now underway? Well, the Coast Guard at the moment, they're trying to disperse the oil that's gone off the sea, um, a boom, uh, putting in spraying oil onto the water, to try and disperse the pollutants. It's also a cleanup operation uh, on the beaches where some of this uh, oil has washed up. But surely, and I think the main effort at the moment is to try and locate this vessel um, and siphon off the remaining oil which is on board. The Philippine Go Coast Guard says that could happen, but they need to find it before they can do that and before uh, any more oil seeps out. The United States has denounced comments by Israel's far-right finance minister, Betzalel Shmotrich, who has called for the Palestinian village of Hawara to be wiped out by the state of Israel. On Sunday, Hawara was subjected to one of the worst cases of mass Israeli settler violence in years. It came hours after two settlers were shot dead by a Palestinian gunman. Here's the U.S. State Department spokesperson, Ned Price. Uh, these comments were irresponsible. They were repugnant. They were disgusting. And just as we condemn Palestinian incitement to violence, uh, we condemn these provocative remarks that also amount to incitement to violence. We call on Prime Minister Netanyahu and other senior Israeli officials to publicly and clearly reject and disavow these comments. Our Middle East correspondent Yolan Nal is in Jerusalem for us and says there hasn't actually been any official direct response to Ned Price's comments, but there would be some distancing from the finance minister's comments. This is, of course, very strong criticism from Israel's most important ally. And we understand that behind the scenes, the same message has been conveyed that uh, Mr. Netanyahu and others in his government must publicly distance themselves from those remarks made by Bezalel Smotrich. He himself has come out on Twitter trying to issue what he uh, is portraying as a clarification, trying to repair the impression that he gave. He said that he had not meant that Hawara, the Palestinian village, should be wiped off the map or erased only that there should be pinpoint action against terrorists, that terrorist supporters who live in the village um, should be acted against, and that also a high price should be exacted from them. He's also said that the job should be left uh, to the Israeli military. Um, but still, this is something that has shocked, actually, a lot of Israelis, too. 
Power has largely been restored across Argentina after more than half the country, that amounts to some 20 million people, was left without electricity for several hours. The blackout was caused by a fire in fields west of Buenos Aires, which hit high-tension power cables and put a nuclear power station offline. Water distribution and city train transport were among services interrupted during the heat wave. Some schools also had to suspend classes. Well, a French government minister is warning the country is on the verge of a water crisis there as an ongoing uh, result of the winter drought. Parts of France has had little or no rain in weeks and water levels have dropped alarmingly. Spain is also suffering from drought, as Tim Ullman explains. This is, or perhaps was, the River Loire, France's longest river, which seems to be disappearing before our eyes. For week after week, no rain has come, the driest period since records began more than 60 years ago. And for the people who live here, these are worrying times. I'm scared. I feel like we'll lack water. I've never seen this. Often at this time of the year, as the snow melts, there's a lot of water. But right now, it's shocking to see the water so low. There's no fishing left. Back in the day, the water levels were high and we caught fish. Right now, it's no good. We can't fish anymore, at least for now. Winter is normally a crucial period in restoring water levels, but not this year. And 2022 was the second hottest year Europe has ever experienced. Lack of rain can have a knock-on effect, reduce crops, greater risk of wildfires and potentially rationing. We are in a particular situation because we are on the verge of a water crisis in our country for next summer. So we're in the process of acting upon it. It's not just France that's suffering. This is the Catalonia region of Spain. More dry riverbeds, more concerns about the future and the problems climate change can cause. Restrictions have already been imposed. People won't be able to wash their cars or fill their swimming pools. Rain is forecast for the coming days, but long term, water, or a lack of it, is still a major concern. Tim Allman, BBC News. The singer-songwriter Joni Mitchell, perhaps best known for her songs Big Yellow Taxi and Both Sides Now, has been honoured for her career at a ceremony in Washington. She was given the US Library of Congress Gershwin Prize, which recognises contribution to music. At Joni is 79, she actually performed at the event, telling the audience she was overwhelmed to see so many old friends. Other musicians also sang her songs, which she began writing in the 1960s in Los Angeles, becoming a leading light in the folk rock era. A man who was told he would need constant care throughout his entire life for developmental disorders is set to become a professor at one of the UK's top universities. Jason Arde was unable to speak until he was 11. He couldn't read or write until he was 18. And now he's about to take up a research position at the University of Cambridge. Celestina Ololude went to meet him. I always felt it was a privilege to have a period of 11 years where I, maybe I couldn't speak and I couldn't converse in a way that everyone else could because it allowed me to see things in a different way. Professor Jason Arde was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder at the age of three. He couldn't speak until he was 11 and read or write until he was 18. Throughout his early years, his parents continued to believe in him. At 18, my mum had got to a point where there was only so much she could do and she was brilliant. Even though she had this belief that, you know, he'll do something okay, but she just decided, I need someone else to believe in him as much as I believe in him. Therapists predicted he would need full-time assistance throughout his life. How wrong they were. You okay? <laughs> it was this man, college tutor Sandro Sandri, who helped teach Jason to read and write at 18. I'm just so happy for him. Uh, um, uh, you know, I'm speechless, to be honest. But I never, I never doubt a moment they would achieve where he is. Sandro would spend hours of his free time teaching Jason. There's one thing you said to me, which I never forgot. Um, and it was when I was 22 and I said to you, I was thinking about doing a PhD. And you said to me, like, you know, it would be the greatest story in the world if the kid who didn't know how to read and write was managed to get a PhD. Like, um, and you said, like, I, I think, you know, 
we can take on the world or you can take on the world and you can win. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I never, and I never forgot that. And now Jason is days away from achieving another ambition. Hey, hey. Nice so you. good to see you. Yeah. Here's his new boss <laughs> at Cambridge. That's, we do have a lot of work to do, but uh, I feel really optimistic. I think. Part of his research will look at new ways to make higher education more accessible for everyone. What can we do to ensure that this isn't a market appointment in five years' time? How can this become the norm? We've listened to the voices of our black scholars and our black students, um, and some of it has not been easy to hear, to be honest, but we're able to face up to some of the um, structural issues that people, that people face. There will be those that think this is a tokenistic appointment. What are your thoughts on this? The Board of Electors on your um, interview day were absolutely unanimous. We are so lucky to have you. Uh, you are the best in the world in terms of the research that you do. An extraordinary journey, but for Jason, this is not an end. It's a beginning. The reaction has been amazing and I'm truly grateful to everyone for their kind sentiment and kind words. We've got a lot of work to do. Celestina Olulode, BBC News, Cambridge. Wonderful story and congratulations to him. Another classic and wonderful story for you because we love the story of the underdog. And we've got one in the sports arena in the UK last night's FA Cup fifth round. There was a classic League Two club Grimsby Town beat Premier League side Southampton 2-1. Grimsby scoring two penalties either side of half time to give them a shock two goal lead. After getting one goal back in the 65th minute, Southampton had their equaliser disallowed. And that sends Grimsby into the sixth round. Now to put this into context, they're the first club in FA Cup history to eliminate five teams from a higher division than them in a single campaign. And there are pictures of this doing the rounds and you may be very curious living around the world why a whole lot of Grimsby fans are holding up a fish. This is a significant fish. He is Harry the Haddock and he is the mascot of the Grimsby team, the mar marine mascot, uh, fished out for major games to help fans cheer on the Mariners and uh, it was amazing to see them all being held up at the celebrating uh, fans as they were holding them up last night. See you again soon. Hello there. Storm Juliet is still going to give a lot of wet weather through the course of Thursday into Friday across parts of Sicily and Corsica, Sardinia, Italy, across into the Balkans. Balkans and down into Greece as well. Strong winds around that system and also developing out of Africa. Another weather front joins in from Malta as well, some wet weather in parts of Tunisia. So really still quite a lot of wet weather, disruptive winds, gales around the Adriatic coastline. Further south and east, it's a little bit drier, but we pick up the showers further north across Turkey. We've got some chillier air filtering southwards across parts of Spain and Portugal. We've got uh, similar issues with some chilly weather under the high pressure for the Low Countries and the United Kingdom. Then some really windy weather, further snowfall to come across Scandinavia and some strong winds and Arctic air across Iceland as well. And that's all heading southwards, that colder air. Still, you can see this uh, storm Juliet is with us, giving some nasty weather through the Mediterranean, across southern parts of Italy, into the Balkans, into Greece, into Turkey. Turkey as well, pushing its way gradually eastwards with time, allowing the cold air to dig in behind. So temperatures falling away, for example, in London and some more unsettled, showery looking picture here and for Paris. Some rains arriving or showers, at least for Madrid as well. It stays looking wintry in Moscow and some showers still around this weekend in Athens. To choose Grana Padano is to embrace its unique Italian values. A moment to be shared. Grana Padano, an Italian feeling. Now showing on BBC Real.
I'm afraid I can't make it because I'd be traveling there especially for you. A Dutch contributor recently responded to a meeting request. Blunt and very honest, a stark contrast to how we speak in the UK. British people and Americans and others to some extent tend to sort of dance around the issues. If you are vague or not direct, then people will say, well, come on, let's be honest so we can move on. I was born in the Netherlands, but grew up in the UK. So I've always noticed the two extremes. British politeness and Dutch directness. But how much truth is there to this stereotype? The Dutch are known as being direct, which means that the style is, that the messages are quite precise and clear. Uh, they say what they mean, mean what they say, so yes is really yes, and yet no is really no. Whereas in most other countries, the communication style is indirect. Watch more stories like this at bbc.com slash real. BBC experts check the facts behind the stories making the headlines. Go to the BBC News website and app to answer any questions you have about the big stories of the day. Reality Check. Get the facts straight. A year on from the beginning of the war in Ukraine, the fighting continues. The Russian lines are very close. In fact, we're hearing they're just maybe a kilometre away. See the headlines as they happen with breaking news alerts in the app and get the full story with bbc.com forward slash news. Follow the story for all the latest with BBC News. You're live with Lucy Hawkins on BBC World News. Angry words over Ukraine as the US and Russia come face to face at the G20 meeting in Delhi. Russia's Sergei Lavrov accuses the West of using blackmail and threats to undermine support for its invasion. But Washington sends Antony Blinken used a 10 minute meeting with his Russian counterpart to restate America's support for Kyiv. There's been protests in Greece at the head-on train collision which killed at least 42. There have been resignations and court appearances, but will that be enough to end the anger? And a royal residence row as King Charles asks Harry and Meghan to give up the Windsor home given to them by the late Queen Elizabeth. In the next half hour, we'll have the latest from Delhi, Greece, Geneva and Windsor Castle. There have been protests in Greece over the rail crash which killed 43 people. Many see this as an accident that had been waiting to happen. Prime Minister Mitsotakis says a committee of experts will investigate the causes of the disaster and that everything pointed to human error being to blame. But rail union members say safety systems weren't working properly and there had been repeated warnings about this. Nick Beek reports from Larissa. The aftermath of Greece's worst ever rail disaster. A station master in a nearby city has now been charged with manslaughter by negligence. And already the country's prime minister says tragic human error was to blame. But that has sparked anger overnight, including in the capital Athens, because for years there have been warnings the rail network was not safe. This surgeon, who came out of retirement to help the injured, says the many young lives lost were the victims of systemic failings. It's a disaster, it's a catastrophic thing. Families are crying tonight. Unfortunately, the majority of the wounded, of the lost people are young students. They left home happy after the long weekend to go for their studies to see or to see their relatives and never reach their case. This is one of the hospitals where survivors are being treated overnight and also where some family members are coming to give their DNA so that their missing loved ones may be identified in the coming hours and days. But this is proving to be a really difficult process, particularly for passengers who were at the front of the train, which bore the full force of the collision and where the fire broke out. And the force of the explosions were captured on camera, two fireballs ripping through the carriages. Visiting the wreckage, Greece's transport minister became emotional as he talked about the country's failing train network and later resigned. It's not known exactly how many passengers are missing, but many families now face an agonising wait. Nick Beek, BBC News, in central Greece.
We can now also go live to Larissa to talk to Andreas Aligneotis, who was on the train at the time that that crash happened. I'm very pleased uh, that we're able to see you right now, Andreas. I'm sure your family and friends were too. I hope you're okay. How are you doing today? I'm um, fine today, thanks. I just returned from the hospital. Uh, now I'm going to the Saloniki to take my clothes because I have no clothes to wear. All of them was in the suitcase uh, inside the train. Did you suffer from any injuries, Andres? I have some injuries uh, uh, on my body in general, but they're not something important. Uh, the only, the only significant injury I, I have is on, on my, on my right knee. Uh, I can't, I can't move my, my right knee at this time. But. Uh, it's not it's not some it's not something important right now I'm because sure. they were such a, they were had a big uh, injuries and uh, many people died between uh, between us uh, among every everybody i'm sure that there is a part of you that feels incredibly lucky to be alive today because so many young people did die and are injured. Do you mind if I ask you to take us back to what exactly happened, what you experienced last night? No, no, uh, look, I was uh, on the train and I was speaking uh, on my mobile to some friends uh, because we have uh, some uh, Uh, a reader uh, in the uh, in the end of the on the train so I have to call some friends to take me uh, from the train station into Saloniki to take me back home but uh, when I was speaking <clears throat> I felt some something like crash and uh, when I heard the, the bang uh, I was already in there uh, with my friends I was bumping into the the bulkheads uh, so it was just terrifying. It was just like a, a horror movie. They were uh, <clears throat> fire uh, out uh, from the train. There were uh, a lot of smoke, so we couldn't breathe. How did you get out of the carriage? Uh, in the beginning, uh, I just uh, start to uh, to talk uh, with the guys to uh, uh, just to stay calm. In the beginning, uh, I was uh, <clears throat> trying to break uh, the glass of the window. Uh, we broke the glass and we start jumping out of the train in order uh, that uh, we'll stay alive from the fire. Andreas, we're very pleased to see you safe and well. I'm so sorry about what has happened though. Uh, all those many people who have been killed. Take care of yourself. Thank you for joining us. Thank you too. We'll continue to bring you stories uh, throughout the day from Greece and uh, three days of national mourning declared there. A lot of sadness, but also public outcry at what has happened with that train crash. India says most members from the group of 20 nations strongly condemned the war in Ukraine, with Russia and China disagreeing after a meeting of foreign ministers in New Delhi. There were angry exchanges earlier between the U.S. and Russia over Moscow's invasion. The U.S. Secretary of State saying the talks have been marred by the unprovoked and unjustified attack. Russian officials, meanwhile, said Moscow and Beijing had agreed to oppose what they called Western blackmail and threats. That hasn't, though, been confirmed by China. Well, let's go to New Delhi. We can join Sahasini Sentha, who is a diplomatic affairs editor at The Hindu. Very good to see you. Uh, so we've got no joint agreement at the end of these talks. Will India be disappointed by this or was it to be expected given the amount of disagreement there is over the war in Ukraine? 
Well, to be honest, it was a surprise that the Indian side was trying so hard for a joint statement. But there are reasons for that which we can come to. Uh, but we did ask the uh, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar a short while ago whether he was disappointed that there was no joint statement. He chose to put a brave face on it. He said that there was agreement on most other things uh, and that it was only Ukraine that was the sticking point. Now, the reason we uh, we understand the Indian side was key to try and forge a joint uh, statement was that last week uh, at the Bangalore Finance Minister's meeting, uh, in what seemed to be a surprise to the Indian side, both Russia and China refused to accept the wording of the Bali document, the Bali G20, which you must have been reporting about in November last year. And Russia and China came out perhaps for the first time in this open way on a multilateral platform to say that they were not okay with the use of the Bali language. Um, what that really means for India is now either they will have to convince Russia and China uh, to come together once again on the Bali formulations, which were taken with a lot of difficulty last year, uh, or actually to start uh, uh, renegotiating the entire language on uh, Ukraine in its joint statement for the leader summit, which is in September this year. Uh, one of the big sticking points, according to Sergey Lavrov, was that it had no mention of the, uh, the Nord Stream uh, 2 pipeline explosion, which he said was a Western conspiracy. He also spoke about the Minsk agreement and other things at a press conference. Uh, perhaps the one bright line from this entire episode has been uh, news now coming in of a possible meeting between uh, Mr. Lavrov and the Secretary of State Lincoln, which would certainly be a first if it's confirmed officially. Sir Sunny, thank you for joining us. And I do apologize, the line to you wasn't very good. Uh, a little bit echoey, but very good to get your thoughts on uh, the meeting in Delhi that has uh, just taken place. The fact that there is going to be no joint statement released from the G20 foreign minister's meeting. Another development to bring you is that the deputy foreign minister of Russia has accused the US of inspecting its nuclear weapon sites to help Ukraine attack them. Sergei Rybakov was speaking at a UN disarmament conference in Geneva. He is due to address the Human Rights Council days before UN investigators publish a report on possible Russian war crimes in Ukraine. Our correspondent Imogen Folks is covering those talks for us. We expect him to defend this decision to pull out of the nuclear arms reduction talks. Analysts say that's a dangerous move when we have such tension around the world. The big nuclear powers aren't talking to each other about reducing their weapons stockpiles. Then later on, he will talk to the Human Rights Council. Now, the human invest UN investigators are looking very hard at evidence of Russian war crimes in Ukraine and their report will be out either next week or perhaps the week after next, depending on the schedule. Mr. Ryabkov will be expected again to defend what Russia is doing in Ukraine. His response is his likely to be met with a certain amount of hostility. Last year, Western diplomats walked out when Sergei Lavrov began to speak here. This year, I'm told there is some kind of protest from Western diplomats planned, but there are others in the room that are semi, at least, friendly with Russia. As you said, India is neutral. Um, there has been a charm offensive in Africa with Russian diplomats touring the continent. Brazil has also suggested it's neutral. I think that Western diplomats, they want to keep the pressure up, but they don't want to show that right here at the United Nations, there are huge divisions over the, the opinion towards Ukraine and this unprovoked invasion. To stay with us here on BBC World News still to come. This is the five bedroom house that Harry and Meghan left behind when they moved to California. Now King Charles is taking it back. We'll ask what this means for the relationship between father and son. Now from BBC Real. It carries with it legacy, carries with it death, devastation, beauty. This incredible jewel has not just been passed down through generations, it's been it's stolen, it's been fought over, it, it's gone through all manner of chicanery and skullduggery to, to get it to its current point. It carries with it a curse because of its sheer history of, of death and deprivation. The Kohenor. 105 carats, oval-shaped, and arguably the world's most famous diamond. 
Today, it's set among 2,800 other stones in the Crown Jewels. It made a public appearance in 2002 atop the Queen Mother's coffin, and again in 2022 at Queen Elizabeth's funeral. In the days following the Queen's death, the word Kohinoor began to trend on Twitter. Many Indians were calling for the diamond to be returned. Of course, as an individual, um, there was nothing but respect for the Queen because she always imparted herself with class and dignity, and that was undeniable. Um, but it also marked a clear point in the Indian subconscious that this is the end of an era linked to India's darkest chapters. But the Kohinoor has been stolen and moved countless times over its long history. The question remains, where might it go next? Original Global Stories from the BBC. You're live with Lucy Hawkins. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have been asked to vacate their British base, Frogmore Cottage. Uh, they were reportedly told to leave the property by Buckingham Palace back in January, days after Prince Harry published his memoir, Spare. The home is in the grounds of Windsor Castle and had allegedly been offered to the Duke of York. Buckingham Palace is yet to comment. Here's our Royal Correspondent, Sarah Campbell. Since leaving the UK for a new life in the States, Prince Harry and his wife Meghan have returned just a handful of times. And when they've done so, such as last June for the Jubilee, they've stayed in Frogmore Cottage, the house gifted to them by the late Queen. The five-bedroom property is situated within the grounds of Windsor Castle. The Duke and Duchess spent more than £2 million on rent and refurbishments according to royal accounts, but their spokesperson has confirmed the Sussexes have now been asked to vacate the property. Once again, it's put royal relations back on the front pages with the King reported to have sanctioned the move and Prince Andrew allegedly being lined up to move in once the Sussexes are out. Buckingham Palace has offered no comment on what are considered private family matters. This all comes in the wake of Prince Harry's memoir Spare and the publicity campaign which accompanied it and their six-part TV series, putting the couple's grievances with the royal family in front of a global audience. In just two months' time, Harry's father, King Charles, will be crowned. It's still unclear whether Harry, his youngest son, and Meghan will be there to witness it. Sarah Campbell, BBC News. Let's get more now from our royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell. Uh, Nick, I was just saying, this is the most clicked on story today on the BBC News website so far. There is still so much interest in Harry and Meghan. I mean, what do you make of this latest? Well, the latest episode in the Windsor, Sussex, soap opera, um, it's clear that the, the King, Buckingham Palace, wants them to vacate Frogmore Cottage. And I suppose it is hard to think how it could be justified that they keep a five-bedroomed house close to Windsor Castle when they are plainly spending very little time in the United Kingdom. Um, it, it's not as if they will be short of accommodation if they do visit. There will be rooms at Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, Kensington Palace, St. James's Palace. So I don't think that they can complain that they will uh, be lacking in accommodation or indeed that that accommodation will be secure. But this is a five bedroom house which is standing vacant. Um, it is reported that uh, the King, King Charles, wishes to move his younger brother, his disgraced younger brother, Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, from the very large, even larger house that he occupies in Windsor Great Park. It's called Royal Lodge, about 30 rooms. Um, and he's only really living there with his ex-wife. Uh, possibly to move him to Frogmore Cottage to free up Royal Lodge. Well, possibly for the Prince and Princess of Wales. But, but that is just me speculating. There is no substance to that at the moment. But Nick, everything you're saying is very practical. But lots is being read into what this means about the relationship between oh, the father relation and son. The relationship is bad. There is no question about that whatsoever. Um, you know, this is a very difficult family disagreement um, being played out on the public stage nationally and internationally. I think there is um, considerable exasperation within the British royal family at the way Harry and Meghan have behaved, in particular the publication of his uh, biography, uh, Spare. I think people were affronted by that. Though, at the same time, and you know, one must be fair and even-handed about this, I've read it, and one comes away with it from it with a greater understanding of the 
tensions, the difficulties that Harry has faced throughout his life. I think that we have always uh, underestimated the degree of emotional and mental strain that he has encountered from the death of his wife to his military service, suffering PTSD after that, panic attacks, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I read it and thought, well, okay, I start to sort of have a greater understanding of where he is coming from, where I think uh, many people, certainly within the family, would find it difficult uh, to show greater sympathy for him is the, the, the betrayal that it represents, the disclosure of so many private conversations. So I think the net result of all of that is that there is little in the reservoir of sympathy within the family towards the couple, um, which is why I think that they are approaching this in quite a hard-headed, practical fashion. Uh, this is King Charles wanting to rationalise the accommodation of members of the royal family. Uh, he wants, I'm sure, to do it sensitively and thoughtfully, but with an eye to how this all looks to the outside world. Do you expect, Nick, to see Prince Harry at the coronation? D Lucy, I honestly have no idea. I suspect that there will be an invitation. I think that it would be in line with uh, King Charles's uh, character and his uh, outlook as a, a loving father to uh, invite his younger son to the coronation. Um, whether Harry will accept, whether he, if he accepts, would bring his wife, um, it is, coincides with the birthday of, of their son, we just don't know. But I'm quite sure that the palace will not want this issue to be speculated about throughout the nine weeks between now and uh, the coronation itself. Nick, I spoke to a lot of people all around the world when Spare was published, just to get their views from other Commonwealth countries, Africa, the US as well. And I wonder, all these weeks on from the publication, how damaging, ultimately, do you think the, the memoir was? Well, damaging to what is, I suppose, what I would come back with. Damaging to, to the, the British monarchy? Mm. I think probably not. You know, the monarchy gets on with what it does. We will learn um, within the next few days of the plans for the first state visits by King Charles, which, as has been widely reported, will be to France and Germany. So, you know, that is the serious business of the monarchy. Has it harmed the reputation? Well, it certainly hasn't done it much good, but, you know, they play this on the very long sort of form. And I think that at some point, you know, over the coming months or years, um, Prince Harry's biography will not entirely be forgotten, but it will sort of recede, or this certainly would be the palace hope, will be receding into the, the sort of long grass, the, the memory, uh, whilst the monarchy in the hands of Charles, in the hands of William and Kate and so on and so forth, will be getting on with the job. It is always lovely to have you with us, Nick. Thank you so much. Uh, good to have you with us too as well. Yelda is up next with Impact. Bye-bye. Introducing the new horizon for Riyadh. This is the new